Hello folks, welcome back to the Whoop Podcast. I'm your host, Will Ahmed, founder and CEO of Whoop, and we are on a mission to unlock human performance. On this week's episode, Whoop VP of Performance Science, our principal scientist, Kristen Holmes, is joined by Todd Anderson. Todd is the co-founder of Synergy Dryland, a training program for world-class swimmers, as well as the co-founder of the Ride Out Strong Marathon Training Program. Todd produces educational content on all media platforms to educate people on sleep and its importance and positive impact on quality of life. He also holds over a dozen certifications in strength and conditioning, nutrition, and performance. Kristen and Todd will discuss Todd's passion for sport and performance, shares about his time as a walk-on for Michigan State football, using data to train athletes, incorporating sleep and recovery into training programs. He's a big believer in nasal breathing and mouth taping during sleep. I know those are growing trends cross country. The impact of sauna and cold plunge on the body and Todd's training non-negotiables. He shares three things that he tries to do every day. Looking to join Whoop, visit our website and sign up for free. That's right, the best offer we've ever had. You can sign up for free for 30 days and try the full Whoop experience. New members can use the code WILL, W-I-L-L, get a $60 credit on Whoop accessories. If you have a question you want to see answered on the podcast, email us, podcast at whoop.com. Call us, 508-443-4952. Without further ado, here are Kristen Holmes and Todd Anderson. Todd Anderson is a human performance expert and trainer who has worked with Fortune 500 companies, professional athletes across all sports, and celebrities on optimizing their performance. Todd is the co-founder of Synergy Dryland, the Ride Out Strong Marathon Training Program, and Dream Recovery. He uses his holistic approach to swimming, running, and sleep to provide athletes with an unparalleled outlook on high performance. Todd's message resonates because it bridges the gap between science and a realistic strategy given the social pressures of being an athlete or functioning optimally in the business world. Todd holds over a dozen certifications in strength and conditioning, nutrition, and performance. Bottom line, sleep and recovery is the tide that raises all boats, and Todd's mission in life is to help others realize their potential by prioritizing sleep, recovery, and overall life optimization. Todd, welcome to the Woot Podcast. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're so fun. I'm so excited for this conversation. <laughs> Same. So, Todd, your passion for health and longevity mm-hmm. is inspirational and infectious. I love following all your content <laughs> on social media. Would love to hear about your early career and you know as an athlete and how that might have shaped your kind of outlook on training performance and longevity yeah so i mean i guess my um my passion for performance started when i was a kid Uh, i was overweight as a kid you know so i was always like a little bit overweight and i always felt like i you know wasn't the best athlete and so i kind of had a chip on my shoulder Mm -hmm. and then in high school i kind of found lifting strength conditioning and realized, you know, what changes I could make through that pathway. So that, that was, that's always been like the, the, um, foundation of my confidence is the weight room. So in high school, I started lifting to a point where like I was lifting by myself before school because I couldn't get people to do it with me because people were like, Oh, I don't want to mess up my shot for basketball, things like that. (laughs) So my dad was some of those myths, right? right, Exactly. There's always something, but, uh, my dad was a teacher, so he'd give me his like security code to get into school before school, exactly. which is probably super illegal, but <laughs> yeah. he's retired now, so it'll be okay. <laughs> it's fine. But you yeah. can put it out there. Yeah. He's not going <laughs> to, yeah. no risk of getting fired. I would, uh, I put the security code in and go in by myself before school because I played three sports. So after school was an option. And, so um, football, football, wrestling, and baseball. Wrestling. Yeah. Dang. That's yeah. a whole other level of. Oh, uh, I think yeah, wrestling is the hardest sport there is. D- d- like no college problem. wrestling is. Yeah insane yeah i do you know very pretty limited but bjj and you know there's no question that like when you're grappling i mean it's like tapping out at 30 seconds like it's yeah. just like it's just a different type of yeah i can't yeah i don't the the fatigue you feel from that is unlike any other yeah um, yeah so I, I was all state in wrestling baseball not in football mm. like that was my worst sport probably wow. ironically <laughs> so um yeah so you know that was like the start of it but you know so i coming out of high school I had no offers and um, 
I was going to go to a Division three school to play football mm-hmm. and ended up, you know, through this wild chain of events, talking to Michigan State's offensive coordinator, and he said they might have a walk-on spot available in the fall. Wow. And at that point, I had no business being at Michigan State. I mean, you know, there's some of the lead athletes, you know, they're, they're recruiting nationwide. They get a lot of good people. Mm-hmm. And I mean, the Big Ten football is, yeah, let's face it, it's no joke. Yeah, it's the best. <laughs> It's the best conference in the nation. That's right. All those SEC people. <laughs> That's right. I'm ready to make that <laughs> argument. But um, so I literally made a pros and cons list with my mom, who was a kindergarten teacher at the time. So she was you know, very Aww. artistic. And we still have the poster. And it was basically you know, pros and cons of going to this Division three school or trying to walk on to Michigan State. Mm-hmm. And what it came down to was, you know, am I going to regret this yeah. you know, at 20 years down the road? There's a lot and of risk. Yeah. And my dad went to Michigan state. We went to games growing up. Like that was, I can't even say it was a dream because it was so outside the scope of, of a realistic goal mm-hmm. that I wouldn't even consider it a dream because it, it didn't even cross my mind. So when I got the opportunity, I was like, I know I'm going to regret this if I don't try. So, I, you know, I took a shot and that's really where my obsession started because I, when I got there, day four, I wanted to quit. I called my parents I was like, I can't do this. I'm so bad. I'm so slow. I'm weak. Every, all of the above. I don't know the playbook. And I, they were literally like getting my transcript around to, to transfer to Adrian College because it was Jeez. so bad. The, that camp was still the hardest thing I've ever done, like yeah. mentally especially. Yeah. So, There's just so much information coming at you. There's oh, just so many tests that you have to it, run. Oh. Like you're, not to mention like <sighs> learning like the offense and the defense and the <laughs> – I always wonder like what the amount of money I would need to go back through that. It would be wow. very high, <laughs> but wow. it's because it just taxed me at every level, like ev- yeah. across the spectrum from an emotional perspective, like mm-hmm. first time being away physically, obviously, yeah. you know, intellectually the playbooks are insane. Yeah. I've never seen a playbook like that. And then, you know, culturally, like I'm from a tiny small town. We had a blinking red light. You know, we had bring your tractor to school day. And then I walk in, to Michigan State, there's people from all different backgrounds. I didn't have right. any friends. Like it was a culture shock. Yeah, and um, stuck it out, and then you know, resorted back to the weight room to kind of build my confidence. So that's when my obsession with like performance and you know how can I squeeze every ounce mm-hmm. of of ability out of myself yeah. started because I felt like I had to do that to compete. Yeah. So I coached at you know Division One yeah. at Princeton for for 13 seasons, and I remember my one walk on, Caitlin Donovan, just absolute savage you know but definitely was coming into the program really raw like just beat down my door you know to have an opportunity to try out and I was really like you know pretty skeptical um you know her dad and mom had both been you know students at Princeton her dad uh played lacrosse and um you know and she just had she was so like gritty and you know had a little bit of a chip on her shoulder because she wasn't a recruited athlete you know but kind of came every single day with just like the swagger and she ended up being one of the best players ever to graduate from Princeton and her three sisters ended up going and graduating, coming to Princeton and graduating two of the three I was able to coach. Uh, one of I recruited, but talk a little bit about that moment where the coach had to make a decision. All right, Todd. Yeah. You're going to be on the team. Like what was that? Like, were you, or were you already kind of, yeah. So I, I kind of, you know, I had, so coach D'Antonio, Michigan state, it was mm-hmm. his first year there. So they had kind of a hard time finding a lot of people to come and, and try to take an opportunity to earn a scholarship early. They call it mm-hmm. gray shirting. Mm-hmm. So they had a couple spots on the roster. So when I, when I showed up, everyone else had been there all summer. I knew I would have a spot at least for the fall. Okay. But I knew I'd be red shirted. So I wouldn't play. Right. And, and really it was like, you have a, you have a, a spot in the fall, but like nothing's guaranteed beyond that. Yeah. So, you know, it, what were your biggest, like, what did you, when you kind of went through the calculus of like, all right, what do I actually need to do to contribute value to this team? Cause you said you're really broken after camp yeah. and like had it, you know, so you, and you said you kind of resorted the, the weight room was like, all right, this is going to be my go-to. Yeah. Like, I'm just going to get as strong and fast as I can. Or if I'm being honest, I, it was pure survival. That first, okay. that first yeah. semester, it was like, <laughs> No plan, it, really, it just, just survival. It, it was day to day, hour to hour, you know, like wow. getting up at 5.50, five, we have five o'clock lifts, 
practices. I mean, I was so tired, tutors, you know, everything. Mm. I was a math major at the time, which oh. was like the worst decision ever. I like, I'm taking Calc 3 in my first semester <laughs> there, and I'm like just drowning. So yeah. that was survival. And then in the spring, during spring ball, I got moved to defensive end, and, you know, I, I've gotten a lot stronger just from our mm. strength conditioning program. And then started going and doing extra lifts with my roommate, Adam, and, and we would, you know, add two extra lifts on a week and just kind of became yeah. obsessed with it. And then started to see some improvements in the spring. I started making some plays, yeah. you know, running with the second string, like a lot of good things started to happen. And that's the point where I, I remember I'm like, I think I can actually do this. Like it went from, wow. it went from, I just hope to play on a special team my senior year to like, I think I can, you know, play here consistently. So and I credit a lot of that to the weight room just because yeah. they put in this extra time. And even if it didn't help the performance on the field, like mentally, just knowing I did more than everybody else, yeah. it made me feel like I could. Yeah. There's a lot of adversity to overcome because then, you know, going into that fall, I pulled my quad, Oof. got out of the shower, slipped and tore it. Like, I mean, I mean, it's still like, you can see, like there's a massive ball in my leg, <laughs> but um, that's your leg. Yeah, it's not, <laughs> it's not something in my body. Yeah, yeah, no, no, <laughs> it's, it's gnarly. Um, wow. Slipped, fell, ran our conditioning test. I didn't want to tell anybody about it. Ran our conditioning test because I'm a walk on. I'm going to get a full ride probably. Ran our conditioning test, woke up. The leg was black and blue. So I'm out for that season. Next season, you know. So medical, you actually can't medical redshirt no, at that sorry, point. Because you obviously redshirted. Yeah. So, wow. Next year, coming into to fall camp. I'm running with the twos, so it would mm -hmm. get a scholarship again. Three days or four days before our first game, I like cut and practice, feel something in my knee pop, ended up, you know, chipping off some cartilage on the head of my femur, had to have surgery. So I just remember now I'm three years in, I went to the Jesus. game. So I had surgery the day before the game. I remember going to the game, our first game that I'm supposed to be playing in, and, and crutching away from the stadium because I couldn't be on the sidelines because they'd want me to get hit. Yeah, so, yeah. I'm crutching away and I can like hear the crowd. It was like a movie scene like by myself and it was just horrible. So now wow. I'm three years in, haven't played good enough to play. Everybody in my hometown thinks I was crazy for going there anyways. And, um, I haven't played it down and you know, people are, you know, assuming I'm just not good enough to play. And I'm like, I yeah. swear I'm good enough at this yeah. point. Yeah. So then wow. the next year, you know, I finally Stayed healthy. I was starting on our third down package, played defensive end, but ended up mm -hmm. switching to fullback. And that's really where, you know, I shined. That was my natural position and just yeah. kind of became like the sledgehammer of the offense. Wow. I love that. You know, it's, you know, and I think about kids who go through cancer, you know, end up becoming doctors, you know, yeah. or have like some traumatic event, you know, mom suffers cancer, passes away. They end up becoming doctors, try to solve like the cancer problem. Like, you know, going through three really traumatic injuries, yeah. like you start, you learn your body in such a different Definitely. way. You have to learn your body in order to kind of overcome because there's just, there's only so much time with athletic medicine, right? Like you're Definitely. like, you're on your own, you know, 22 hours of the day. Like yeah. what, you know, just when you think about the injuries, like how does that inform how you think about your approach with athletes today? I think that I mean, listening goes a long way. I think yeah. athletes, athletes are so in tune with what they're doing and how they feel for the most part. And every single time I thought something was wrong, mm. it was. Yeah. And I think athletes probably have even better litmus tests of, of how they're doing. So I think having empathy and being relatable to how they feel. And, you know, I think when someone gets hurt or goes through something like that, everyone wants to act like, tell them why it's okay and mm. why they're going to be fine. And yeah. it's not okay. Yeah. You're, you're pouring your heart and soul into something. So telling somebody it's okay is the last thing they want to hear. Yeah. So I think yeah. understanding that like, it's okay that you're pissed yeah. and it's okay to embrace that feeling. Those are normal emotions to Definitely. feel. <laughs> and you can kind of, you know, refocus and use that energy to, yeah. to you know, build your comeback and rehab and, and get back to where you were. But yeah. I think just, you know, being able to understand exactly what that feels like is powerful of anything. It's, it's just being able to relate and, and have a conversation and, you know, tell them it's okay to feel the way they're feeling. Yeah. You were a very early adopter with whoop. So you've very. been on the platform for six years. Yes. You know, talk about, you know, you just, you just mentioned, you know, athletes know their body, yep. you know, and it, it's interesting, you know, when I was coaching, I was, sub, you know, and I was an athlete, you know, subjected to a lot of different types of questionnaires, w which are great to try to assess, you know, how actually am I feeling and how that might correlate to what I can do and how I can train that day. 
you know, I'm wondering like, how do you see data as like a, a nice bridge to kind of help contextualize potentially how you're feeling, you know, cause that's like an interesting, you know, you're coaching athletes yeah. who are, who arguably, you know, at the very tip of the spear, you know, you think about your, your wife, Katie Hoffman, or like, you know, a, a marathon and, and triathlete, like a, a Ken ride out, like, I mean, you coach some of the best athletes. Like, how do you think about using data to inform that yeah. kind of conversation? I think for athletes focusing on like, I, I love the monthly reports and the yearly reports because, yeah. you know, you can look at, you know, your training cycles meets, you know, maybe it's a, a relationship thing going on. Maybe yeah. it's a, a move, different coaching, whatever it could yeah. be. And you can kind of, you know, correlate what's going on and, you know, what your recovery looks like, your strain, mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, even like your sleep quality quantity and, and look mm -hmm. at how those life events are affecting, you know, the outcomes and your recovery scores, because yeah. the day to day it's useful, but there is part of being an athlete and just getting it done. Oh, like it doesn't matter no what that number yeah. says yeah. and you have to perform. So, yeah. Um, it's those weekly trends are actually definitely. a little bit more informative than kind of the acute kind of perturbations because there's going to be, if you're training, hard and you're an elite athlete, those pertur perturbations can be, I mean, the fitter you are, arguably the kind of the less perturbation you'll see if yep. you're in a maintenance phase. But when you're in functional overreaching phases, there's going to be a lot of perturbation and, you Definitely. know, reds, you know, lower end of the spectrum, yeah. yellows, and, and that can be off-putting, I think, for an athlete to your, I think, to your point. Definitely. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I think a lot of people, depending on the personality, will actually have them not wear it or not look at it yeah. two days prior to meet day yeah. because and we now have a feature where you can actually hide yes, the various awesome. aspects that's isn't awesome. it just yeah, amazing great. because yeah because it regard like i said regardless if you wake up and it's you know not the national championship yeah. and you're a, a four percent recovery like yeah one something's probably going on but you're going to go out there and play yeah. and you have to get it done yeah and, and i always tell people the body like we were saying the body is very adaptable right. and people can do amazing things even in in bad conditions so no as question. much as we like to optimize everything like Michael Jordan used to stay up all night and then drop 50 points. So you can get it done. And there's, there's something to the mentality of just performing it, whatever, in whatever situation you're at and not really worrying about it. Yeah. So I think that using it individually and tailoring the approach and the conversations mm -hmm. based on the person's personality yeah. is the way to go. Yeah, I think so. I, you know, it's, it's, I, I try to, you know, I talked to my, my son, you know, is, is, uh, just getting onto whoop, uh, pretty recently. And, um, you know, he's got big starting his ice hockey, uh, weekend. So kind of opening weekend and, you know, hasn't played, plays a lot of golf, uh, at a pretty, pretty high level and hasn't played a ton of hockey over the course of the summer. I'm like, dude, you know, like just embrace it. It's gonna, you know, yeah. but being able to kind of hide the data, I think is just such a, it's a game changer because you, know? you just, you can just focus on what you need to do. And, and one of the things I always try to tell tell anyone I, I talk to work with, it's, it's like the, the sum of your behaviors, you know, it's like try to just be as consistently, you know, optimized as you can. And then when you do have these perturbations, these stressors in your life, you'll be more resilient to kind of manage Definitely. those. So how do you think about, you know, when you're training, you know, athletes and you're thinking about sleep and recovery component, you know, how do you frame up that conversation with athletes and what do you, what do you focus on first? So kind of go through that diagnosis process. Yeah. Yeah. That process is, um, I would say it's different for every person, mm -hmm. but I think that, I think the psychology surrounding sleep is probably the thing that's lagging most in the world of recovery mm -hmm. and just people's relationship with sleep. Yeah. Like data is great, but you know, your feelings towards it and the thoughts you're having surrounding it in your environment are so, so powerful. Yeah. And it, and people don't really want to talk about that very much. You know, yeah. it's usually just like, what are my sleep cycles? Like how much am I getting? What's my score? Which is yeah. great. But like if, if you're thinking about sleep, chances are it's not going to go well. Yeah. Right. When you're actually in the moment. So yeah. I think the first thing we, we start on is just some uh, self assessment and we have them write down a notebook just when they go to bed and when they wake up or, yeah. you know, you can use a yeah. tracker and then, uh, just rating one to 10, like how they feel in the morning. And then just, a like, a you know, quality perspective, one to 10, um, how they think they slept. Love it. And, just so a if simple it's baseline, very simple yeah. and just getting it, you know, a baseline and, uh, evolving from there of, of just, so if that number that their, you know, perspective on how, how their quality of sleep is, is, you know, less than six or so, we, you know, above an eight, usually in a pretty good place. Mm. Then we start peeling back the layers of why they're feeling that way. Yeah. Um, and what we can do to make it better. But let's say, you know, we're looking to improve on some things from there. We, we usually turn to the environment 
and how they're feeling. So environment could be, that's a low hanging fruit. You can Mm -hmm. tweak things Mm -hmm. and it's not very, um, you know, time consuming or thought consuming. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if they are having issues, talk about why they're having those issues. Cause Mm -hmm. people will tell me all the time, they're like, I'm a horrible sleeper. Mm -hmm. And then you peel back the layers and it really has nothing to do with sleep. Yeah. It's about stress management. What right. are they thinking about when they wake up in the middle of the night? Yeah. And actually confronting those issues head on. During the day. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. During the day. <laughs> so not in the middle of the night. Head during the middle yeah. of the night. Yeah. And, and you know that or they're sitting there thinking about how much sleep they're getting. They, they wake up and they're like, yeah. you know, oh man, I have practice in the morning. Right. I've only slept three hours. Practice in two hours. Like I'm going to feel horrible. And then this just this thought process just goes in a circle and they can't fall back asleep. So that's what I'm talking about with their relationship with sleep. And, and you know, one of the the best things to do is give them case study examples of people who haven't slept well and done amazing things. And that it's okay. If you can't sleep, you can't sleep, take it up, take your mind off it. Don't lay there for 30 minutes and beat yourself up. Then all of a sudden they tend to have a much easier time going back to bed. I love your, you know, I think your approach is a very empathetic one. And I know you trained and work with, um, Dr. Jennifer Martin from yeah. UCLA, yeah. I believe, yeah. yes. uh, who's just she's amazing. an expert in insomnia and, and I think she's in geriatric yep. tricks, right? Yep. Um, but I know her work is sensational. I, I imagine she was, uh, very influential in kind of helping you f- develop a yeah. framework around folks or an empathy for folks who maybe are struggling with sleep. Yeah, I think that, you know, because she comes from like the, the psychology mm-hmm. background. Very clinical, yeah, yeah. background. Yeah. yeah, and I think it, it from the get-go, it morphed how I thought about sleep yeah. as opposed to, you know, what supplements can we take, what bed, what temperature, like all those things are great, but I think the psychology side of it has such an impact. And that's really where 90% of the problems lie. There's no question. You know, yeah. yeah it's, it's not like there's some physiological thing going on. It's It's... Your relationship, yep. what's happening throughout the day, and then you know the yeah. impact it's having on your body. Yeah, there, you know, new feature on Whoop, the stress monitor. I don't know yep. if you've dug oh, yeah. into that, but I mean, it is wild to see how the correlation between your stress during the day and how that is relative to your baseline. Definitely. As you know, it's you know on scale of one to it's on scale of zero to three. Yep. And I, I notice, you know, the more minutes I have in a higher stress zone relative to my baseline. Sure enough, I, it kind of rears its head in my sleep and that I don't end up getting into those deeper stages of sleep. Mm-hmm. So understanding, I think, you know, one of, I think our, one of the biggest contributions I think, you know, Whoop is going to make in the scientific literature is being able to show the relationship between daytime stress management and the quality of your sleep at night. There's not a lot of literature around that, but I think, I think to your point, like, I think if people can recognize that connection and recognize that it's what we do during the day that is going to and how we manage our relationships and in our connections and you know the degree to which we're living with purpose and the degree that we feel efficacy you know that we can have the skills and resources to do what we're asked to do and have a sense of autonomy like understanding that those kind of simple frameworks during the day are really what influence our ability to quality you know sleep at night and making 100 percent is and huge I, and i think that that's but I think the hard part is with that is that's a long process to correct and, it, it, and, it really is. and impact. Yeah. And yeah. so I think people shy away from that because yeah. they're not, not quite ready to go down that journey or that path. How do you get people to do the work? Like that's what this is about, right? It's, yeah. it's the interior well, work. I think it, I think it's very similar to how you would coach someone in nutrition, you know, mm. if, from, from a dietetic perspective, I think, you know, building habits along the way, very small, tangible habits, yeah. you know, for multiple weeks at a time where it literally could be just writing down what time you went to bed, right. something that small, or it could be, you know, turning the lights dimmer at 7 PM, little things like that. I think you have to establish it in these small habits because you can't make massive changes, especially at the psychological level overnight. Yeah. And it's going to have to be ingrained to the point where it's subconscious. Right. And so it's a long process and I think people don't want that. So all of a yeah. sudden like, People start throwing supplements at it and they start throwing all these different, you know, modalities. On top of an inefficient system. Yeah. And yeah. it's just, most of the time it's just, it's creating more of an issue. Right. So. so I think, you know, I've always, my thesis has always been like the, one of the, the pathways to improving our psychology and our mindset is actually through our physiology. And I know you, you know, you think a lot about respiration and breathing. Um, let's kind of talk about, you know, how we can think about controlling our breath throughout the day as a pathway to improve our sleep. It's kind of like backing into sleep without focusing on sleep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think for breath, 
I think in the space right now, mm. it's borderline overwhelming with all the um, philosophies. Modalities. Oh my mm. gosh, it's, it's wild. Like yeah. the, you know, if you search like breath work, you're gonna get just eighteen thousand different protocols and stuff like that. And so, it's conflated with mindfulness and meditation. I'm like, okay, those are different. Like you know, it's yeah, just it's, tough it's, for it's the layperson. And, yeah. and I think it is a little bit. Um, I would say, especially you know, for the athletic population. It's not something that people are, are excited about or mm. want to jump into. So I think getting that buy-in is is very important. Mm-hmm. And you know, obviously we use the mouth tape. You know, with, with Three Recovery, that's that's our main product. But I think the mouth tape is a really useful way, especially for somebody that's not fully bought in already, yeah. to experience some of the changes without having to necessarily be really dialed into protocols because mm-hmm. your body naturally has to. It's almost like bumpers for your for your body. Yeah. You know, so. It, it allows or, or it forces you to kind of calm your nervous system and, and control your breathing. Mm-hmm. So we love doing that because we find it a hard time, especially with younger athletes, to fully get the buy-in from yeah. from a breathwork perspective, especially if they're on their own. But I will say, just bringing awareness, similar to sleep or, or mm-hmm. nutrition, like you know, logging your food, yeah. bringing awareness to your breath is such a, a massive step. I think yeah. most people don't even think twice throughout the day free generally, Very free. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, Super free. I think people undervalue like the, the democratically available modalities, yeah, like it, the breath work in the sunshine and it's and, a direct link. It's not yeah. this roundabout way to direct link to your nervous system. It's yeah. such a fast path. And but I think with all this, the stuff out there, people don't realize like when it comes to our nervous system, it's just a sliding scale. Yeah. You know, it's not like binary where you're either you know, sympathetic, parasympathetic. It's a sliding scale. And basically your breath is, is, you know, your fingers sliding this bead back and forth on that yeah. path. And so, you know, if your inhales are longer than your exhales, you're going to slide yes. it up. And if it, your exhales are longer, you're going to, you know, downregulate. Right. And it comes down to being that simple. So I think once you build awareness, then you educate somebody on exactly how those inhales and exhales impact yeah. their nervous system. It doesn't have to be that complicated. Right. And now you can get into some more in-depth protocols, but for the most part, you know, spe- especially somebody starting out, I yeah. think just having a little bit of education goes a long way. Yeah. I think that's that's so well said. Talk about, I know that, you know, and just for folks who are listening, scientist here, so the difference between a a peer-reviewed study and antic data, they're they're totally different. We're going to talk antic data right now. So um, It's probably like your worst nightmare sometimes. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, totally. I'm like, ah. No, but but I think we we have unprecedented access to seeing the relationships between some of these modalities that were um, interventions that we're deploying yeah. when we're working with clients and seeing the impact on the objective data that we're tracking. Definitely. So I know you have some really interesting case studies yeah. that, where you have seen folks tape their mouth yep. and you see changes in, in sleep architecture. So talk a little Definitely. bit about the relationship there. Yeah, I think, I think what's been the most interesting um, from case studies is a lot of the people that we're working with are very aware and from a um, compliance perspective and, and, you know, all these different applications we have surrounding sleep, they are high compliance and they are doing all the right things. Yeah. Right. So you, so you're trying, you're squeezing efficiencies right, at this well, point with a lot of athletes. But that's what I thought, right? Yeah, same, but same. what's, what's been amazing <laughs> to see is for example, my friend Rebecca, she is a, uh, she's a national level weightlifter. Mm. I mean, the most dialed in person I know. Like everything down to the hour, never drinks, does everything perfect. Mm-hmm. Like I would have, I would be, I was actually shocked that if we could help, to be honest. That's <laughs> yeah. how dialed in she is. Yeah. And she started taping her mouth and her, like her slow wave sleep increased close to 15% a night on average in, with her REM. So yeah. the restorative sleep in general went up almost 25% on average yeah. throughout the first week. Yeah. And that's somebody that never had a sleep issue, never, you know, d- has done breath work, does it pretty yeah. regularly, very regimented workout routine, you know, getting nine hours of sleep a night, great nutritional plan. So we've seen that dozens of times. Yeah. And I think that, you know, sometimes it, it can be psychological or, mm-hmm. you know, things going on throughout the day, but it also can be structural mm-hmm. and just, just our airways and our pathways and, you know, how we, we breathe and like we were talking, the thing is we don't really have perspective. It's, it's one thing that we've only slept as ourselves our entire life. So when people are like, how do you sleep? If you're able to go to sleep and you sleep, you know, seven, eight hours, yeah. most people will say I sleep well. Yeah. And that's what I thought about myself too. But yeah. it turns out you might not be sleeping as good as you what could be. What do you be. leave it on the table? 
Yeah. That is like, and, I know. and that's like when I, I know. you know, when I interact with the very best basketball player in the world, let's just yep. say, and they're like, Hey, I'm already really good. What can you actually do for me? I'm like, well, how do you know what you might be leaving on the table without right. actually looking at some of this objective, I mean, especially sleep. I mean, I feel like getting a window into your sleep is just the optimal, like power play. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know? It's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, it's, it's been, it's been life changing for me yeah. over the last three years, Insane. really um, taking it to another level and trying some different things. And I feel like I'm to a point where I, I really have a good perspective of, of what my do- body does and needs and, mm. and, you know, what's going to move it spread. around. Yeah, it, you know, exactly. And so, I mean, it's been, it's been, it's revolutionary. So yeah. I think that, I think it's also, it's a, quite a process for people. You yeah. know, it's not like you just jump into it no, and figure no, no. it out. But you have to be like, you have to commit to it. You know, like sure. there's nothing like behavior change is really hard. Like, and so just yeah. figure out, okay, what, are the foundational elements, you know, and that's what I love so much about your work pod is like you get at the foundation, right? Definitely. I think to our, the earlier point we were you know, discussing, like if you don't have like sleep and recovery dialed in, like you are layering, you know, shit on top of shit, yeah. <laughs> like oh, inefficiency sorry. on top of inefficiency. And it's Definitely. like, you just have to, you know, it, in, in, there is going to be, I think a moment where you have to kind of grapple with some truth that can be distressing. Yeah. You know, so I, I'd love for you to kind of just, like we talked about it briefly, but just, tap into that a little bit more. Cause I, I think, I think for folks who, you know, like I, one of my buddies just got onto the platform, he's been in special operations and, um, he's like, Oh my God, I know it's going to be really shitty, <laughs> my data, yeah. you know? And it's like kind of confronting that. How do you advise folks to just be open to, you know, this might not look great. Yeah. I think that, well, I think just explaining just that, I think that explaining, like you said, what are you leaving on the table? And I think circling it back to that why and what mm-hmm. they're trying to get better at, because yeah. it's almost like when people don't want to go to the doctor because they get blood yeah. work because they're nervous, which is actually like the, the craziest philosophy. Cause I'm like, don't you, you need to know, <laughs> yeah. like, I'm like, how do you not want to know? But I, I get it because, um, like things are going okay. Yeah. Why do I want to upset the apple cart? And but- the other thing that always blows my mind with that is I'm like, sleep is like a pretty enjoyable thing. I'm like, we're talking, I mean, we're not talking about doing like, you know, assault bike sprints here. We're talking about sleeping more and relaxing yeah. and, and people like sometimes really are resistant, but I think they're resistant because oftentimes they know the underlying cause It yeah. could be, you know, emotional stress, relationship right. stress, whatever it may be. Right. And that can be a painful process, yeah. but especially with athletes, I think, you know, bringing it back to the why mm-hmm. of why they're doing this, why they're training, what they're, what they're shooting for. And then relating that to specific performance metrics that, that you know, certain studies or data has shown yeah. is really useful. And that when I go talk to teams, a lot of times I try to bring in studies and, and case studies about performance metrics that they care about right. and relate it to sleep. And then it might break that barrier. Totally. Because you, you have to, you know, you have to appeal to the person you're talking to. And it's a bit of a sales pitch. Yeah. Because they don't have to do this. They're sleeping on their own. So mm-hmm. it's going to be something they're you know, layering onto their day to day. So yeah. you do have to kind of sell them on it and get them yeah. bought in. And so I think that, for example, you know, there's been studies at Stanford about, um, start times off the blocks with mm-hmm. a certain number of hours of sleep. Yes. And when I go talk to the swim team, you know, they could be barely listening, but all of a sudden you, you pull something like that where look, you can drop 0.15 seconds yep. just by sleeping eight and a half hours a night. Yeah. All of a sudden you have their attention and some of those issues they might not have been willing to, to, um, you know, face head on all of a sudden, mm-hmm. You know the conversation starts and, yeah. and they can they're, they're actually open to dealing with yeah yeah i feel like those performance metrics are just really critical um you know just doing research across you know with frontline healthcare clinicians yeah. you know what is the metric that they actually care about you yeah. know they care about surgical errors they care about you know so kind of having some of that context can definitely improve the motivation yeah what's wild though is is we're still pretty early in sleep study. Like there's not much out there. No, there, there isn't. It, it's like, you know, I would say up until what, maybe five years ago, 10 years. I mean, let's say 10 yeah. to be safe, but up until that point, there's even very little on, you know, direct relationships with performance outcomes. Most of it's just clinical, no you know, you yeah. know, apnea, things like that. Yeah, but yeah. as far as actual, per- and there's still not that many, yeah. like especially in sport, like yeah. specific sport outcomes very minimal yeah. is, uh, across we're, the board. So we're about to publish some, uh, a study, um, that we did with UCLA. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, they're, really, they're, they're on the front line of a lot they, of this. They really are. Uh, it has been such a joy to, to work with them. Um, and you know, we're, we actually with their football team and, um, 
bunch of teams, but we were looking at reaction time and sprint times and yep. you know all the performance metrics that, that these folks care about. We looked at GPA. Um, we were trying to replicate um, a finding from that um, Andrew Phillips uh, did with Harvard, looking at four years of sleep, subjective, when you go to bed and when you wake up, and they were able to correlate sleep consistency with GPA, which is not surprising yeah. given that we know sleep consistency drives quality of sleep. Yeah. Um, quality of sleep is where all the magic um, happens, you know, physically, yeah. mentally, and emotionally. So I thought that was a really interesting study. The other one that we saw, and, you know, that was, I think, really kind of an epic finding, again, linking the psychology and the physiology, which is a lot, you know, what I love at WHOOP is we're so well positioned to kind of do oh, this yeah. type of research at a scale that is unprecedented in the field. Yeah. And we basically found that the sleep deprivation of the leader correlated to the psychological safety of their team. Wow. So how psychologically safe mm -hmm. the direct reports of the CEO felt was directly correlated with the amount of sleep debt that they had. What setting was that? CEOs. Um, so these are kind of CEOs who are clients of McKinsey. So it was a hundred person study. That's so amazing. Really big data set. Yeah. I'd and, love um, to see that in a team setting. Ex right. And, and this is what I think I get goosebumps when I think about it. You know, you think about how underslept and underrecovered coaches are. Oh, I mean, it is football just, coaches in, uh, is it, insane. Mind blowing, right? And, and to think about the mental health issues that those folks face, you know, that are well yeah. documented, you know, I mean, you think about Urban and like, you know, all these guys. Yeah. Who Actually, just, I, I talked to Coach Tucker at Michigan State about his sleep. Like, he, I, you know, he's, I mean, I don't know how they do it. Yeah. So I think that there's an incredible opportunity for leaders of teams to really lean into sleep. 100%. Knowing that they're, you know, athletes, they're soldiers, like whoever they are leading, their surgical team is going to be far more productive when you are carrying less sleep debt. That's, that's just like opening my eyes to like how many cool, you know, studies and correlations you could do. I, I think football is an awesome sport to do it because it's, it's an extreme, like the yeah. schedules of coaches are wild. Oh, it is wild. And, yeah. um, but I would be interested even to take it a step further and look at records compared to the, and I also am curious just from a team dynamic perspective of would the amount of sleep correlate more in, in the safety of, of the team with the captain or the coach who would have a bigger impact? Wow. I mean, I think there's gotta be, I mean, it'd be really interesting to look at, but I'm sure there's, it's a really powerful combination Both. of the yeah. two. Yeah. yeah. There's no, no question about it. And, and you think about, you know, the more sophisticated you become as a leader, the more you can probably hide it. But what was really cool about this study is that these are the cream of the crop CEOs. Like best these are, the best. these are sophisticated human beings. And to be able to see an effect with those folks, imagine the less sophisticated individuals yeah. who are carrying sleep debt. And, and, and I think about this, not just in the context of, you know, your soldiers and your teams, but what about your kids? Well, so I, when I you come I, home, I talk about that all the time. <laughs> How I, psychologically I, safe is your home environment? hundred percent. And I, I always, you know, I have this conversation and people think of sleep as this selfish thing. Like, Oh, you're lazy. Like you're going to sleep nine hours. But I think it's actually the most selfless thing you can do because yeah. As, if you're a coach, a parent, a husband or wife, whatever mm -hmm. it is, when, when you're accepting the fact that you're going to be chronically underslept, mm -hmm. you're accepting the fact that you're going to be, you know, 75% of the, the spouse, the coach, mm -hmm. the teammate, um, yep. the, the wife, husband, whatever it is, you're accepting you're going to be 75% of what you could be. Yeah. And so it's actually extremely selfless to commit to sleep. And yeah. I think that you're able to show up for people on your team so much more like you said, which makes mm -hmm. sense of the data coming yeah. out um, when you're, you know, optimized, especially in sleep, yeah. because people don't realize, like, I think s sleep, people often associate sleep with feeling tired, mm -hmm. but a lot of the out or a lot of the effects are subconscious where you're, you're probably not even noticing, like, mm -hmm. you know, your emotional intelligence, yeah. reaction how you times, hold your face, exactly, your eyes, how, how you emote, exactly. And yeah. how you read people's faces, even, yes. you know, there's stuff on that. Yeah. So it's like, you, you're not going to realize the impact it's having. It's not like, Oh, I'm tired today. No, no, that's, that's the tip of the iceberg, truly yeah. the tip of the iceberg. It's, it's how am I going to react? You know, how do I look, how to respond? You know, my mood stability, all those things. Yeah. So awesome. And you're not going to really realize that's going on until some of the things start to deteriorate in your life. Yeah. And we actually just finished um, some internal research looking at sleep consistency. So when you go to bed yep. and when you wake up and how stable that is. And we saw basically after 45 minutes of variability, every minute we see decrements in HRV and resting heart rate. Wow. So like 45 Like minutes, almost predictable? Like yeah. You can so predict. we can predict your 
recovery next day and the knock on your recovery after 45 minutes. Wow. So it's, so that, that window of it. So knowing kind of the, your right and left flank, yeah. I try to stay inside that window as yeah, much as 45 possible. Minutes. Right. Cause I know that after, you know, every minute after 45 minutes, like I'm going to start to see a decline. And we see this with, with, um, exec, executive functions. So looking at mental control every 45 minutes, every minute after 45 minutes, you get stupider. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, but what and, percent of the population is doing that every single Friday and Saturday? It, exactly. So, and not, and that's a whole, we, social jet lag is a whole nother oh. conversation, right? Like when you have, and basically for listeners, social jet lag is essentially, you've got the five days during the week, let's say where yep. you're pretty stable and then you're like going out and you know, we can talk about your bachelor party that you just went to and your data around that. <laughs> but you, you know, what happens when you go, when, when you're basically, you've got the five days where you're relatively consistent and then the weekends you're just like, you know, wildly inconsistent, you know, we're talking hours and hours, you know, yeah. you know, in compared to your kind of weekday consistency that has an enormous, um, impact on your system in the form of like stress. You know, you can't, you can't feel, there's no more like, feeling so unsafe. <laughs> yeah, you know? I felt it. I, yeah. we, we battle with this with especially young athletes, like high school athletes. Mm. Um, because like on the weekend, for example, yeah. right? Like there's a balance of also like being a kid and for having sure. friends and for things sure. tend to be late. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. and then also, right. They can sleep forever. And yeah. oftentimes, you know, a Sunday is the only day they don't have morning practice. Yeah. So or sleep until noon. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's finding that balance where they probably, you know, are sleep deprived, especially by the end of the week, if they have morning practices yeah. and chances are they're probably going to stay up late. And it's like, Yes, you know, like you're saying, consistency is probably more important than we even realize at this point. But on the flip side, you know, having those relationships and hanging out with your teammates and being a, a normal kid or, or yeah. even adult, yeah, that balance is tough. And it's I think it's hard to draw that line. I don't know exactly where that line is, but you know, I think I think really it's it's you know meeting the person where they're at and then c trying to gradually like yeah. pull them closer to that midline. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, we struggle, we we battle with that, and I think that it's yeah. it's tough. It's tough to prioritize some of those things. Yeah. And I think, you know, modernity has not helped in that we have access to, to food and lights, you know, yeah. 24 seven. Right. But it, yeah. I think for me, like where like sleep health equity, like we need to kind of get back to a place though, where we're, in, we're within normal bounds, you know, like you think about the mental health disorders, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, like mm -hmm. all of our behaviors when we're younger ladder up to kind of how affected we're going to be by and how vulnerable we're going we're to be to disease. So I, I think that while, yeah, it's like being a normal college kid, but you know, is binge drinking on the weekends. I don't think that's something we should normalize. No, you know, but it, it is, it, it, <laughs> oh, with no question right. about it, you know? So I think that we lack the courage to take like a real stance on college campuses and like, what is actually normal? Like, yeah. it, you know, so I, I get not to get on my soapbox, but I think it, it's, I think we have to understand, and that's why I do the research that I do, is I want to understand, okay, when I go a minute after, you know, if my, my sleep-wake variability extends beyond 45 minutes, there is, gonna, there is going to be a cost. Mm -hmm. You know, we look at non-suicidal ideation, for example. I mean, the, the folks, the, the college kids who have the biggest nighttime variability, night-to-night uh, -night variability, sleep-wake variability, are more vulnerable to non-suicidal ideation to the kids who aren't experiencing those big variability, those, those big swings in night to night variability. So there are, it comes at a real cost. Yeah. So I think, you know, we need to be way more overt in educating folks, you know, younger. Um, so they understand where are these bounds and at what point, cause we're, we've never been at a more exciting time in human history where we actually have these we data. Know. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think though, I will say, I think the movement has started. I, think I, I, I agree. With, I feel with, it. Yeah. with kids and knowing kids and knowing what it was like when I was there. Yeah. And we were, we were, you know, the, the outliers where we even thought about sleep yeah. or not doing it for a workout, something yeah, like that. Yeah. So there's kids now, you know, and, and credit a lot of the professional athletes, you know, guys like LeBron for yeah. taking recovery seriously Pat because Holmes, exactly. Rory, like it's, yeah. it's, um, it's cool to take care of yourself now. Yeah. Like that was never a thing. Right. It was like, you know, like burning the candle both ends. Exactly. Like have as many shots as I can. You know, like people will be, you know, if you're going to be the out. man at night, be the man in the morning. Yeah, that's what I say. Yeah. But now totally. I think, you know, normalizing, taking care of yourself and, you know, all the recovery modalities and all that stuff. I think that that's starting to revolutionize things. And not only for, 
young athletes. I think that for society, mm-hmm. I think that I bet over the next 10 years, you're going to see tons of mocktail bars. I have a pretty cool, uh, concept that <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to say it on here, spirit. but it's going to be pretty awesome. It'll be in Nashville, hopefully. But, nice. um, you know, I think that, that, I mean, that's why I think with the song of cold, that's why I'm so attracted to it because the reason why people gravitate towards alcohol, mm-hmm. you're kind of mimicking those responses from a neuromodulator perspective with those modalities. So yeah. if you want to do a sauna cold plunge, you get some of that same response with the dopamine hit, yeah. you know, extreme. And, yeah, like it, it, it definitely. Just, yeah. And it, and it creates more of a social connection. You want yeah. to be more talkative yeah. and you're also stuck in a space, with no phones and, and you're, you know, four feet from each other and yeah. going through a little bit of, you know, controlled adversity. Yeah. And a lot of the same connections are made that people use alcohol for. So yep. I think it's, it's, a, it's an awesome way to combat that. Ah, oh, that's such a, that's such an amazing analogy. Okay. Let's, let's dig into recovery. Yeah. Um, I think it's really, um, amazing insights on the, on the sleep side. How do you think about, you know, when you're training athletes, do you have kind of a taxonomy in terms of what recovery modalities seem to move the needle the most in terms of, you know, sleep and kind of markers of inflammation and recovery? We tend to reframe it and we really use it as more prep. You know, we don't, we don't like to talk about recovery necessarily as much as preparation because mm, I, love that. I think, yeah, I think preparing your body for what you're about to go through is far more powerful than being reactive post because we can do yep. some stuff, but it's, it's limited. It's, yeah. It has a limited, um, you know, response, especially mm-hmm. in competition. So I think, you know, really preparing yourself for what you're about to go through is, is the framework we like to use. And I think, I think the, you know, we try to, I'm, we'll sleep again. Sleep is the foundation, right? Yeah. So like, that's the we ultimate recovery. Hammer, we hammer <laughs> that. Modality. Like, like, and I, I don't think people realize like people were talking, even like sauna, cold punch, all that mm-hmm. stuff. But like that, that's a sliver compared to what sleep's going to yeah. have or, or what sleep's going to impact. So we make that very, very clear. We do a sleep presentation within the first two months of every new team mm-hmm. we work with or every mm-hmm. athlete. Yeah. Um, just talking about the science behind it and, tr- and trying to relate specific studies and education yep. to get to, to more. Discipline, yeah. So yeah. whatever sport we're working with, we're going to pull, you know, the best data we can surrounding that specific sport yep. to really try to get them bought in and it actually works pretty well. You'd be surprised. You know, it's amazing, especially when you go to college campuses and I, and I, a lot of times I'll have the coaches leave the room mm-hmm. and we're going to have an honest conversation about yep. alcohol, totally. THC, nicotine, caffeine. Yep. Right. And so they feel comfortable asking questions, yeah. but when you educate the kids and, and, and they're listening and bought in, like they want to be the best they can be. And even yeah. mo- more now than ever, because I think with NIL, the amount of money involved. Oh yeah. It's, it's serious. Kids want to be the best of the best. Yeah. And I, it's amazing when you give them the education, what changes they make. Yeah. It's, I agree. It's, I've just seen just insane changes that lead insane. to championship. I mean, FSU. I mean, we've run five national championships right now across softball and soccer. And yeah. like, it's just like, it's wild. But, but it's, it's hard to like unlock the key to the kingdom by getting that buy-in. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, you can have a, every expert come in and if they just tell them, you know, don't drink, don't do these things. It's yeah. bad for you. They're not going to care. No. They've been saying that for 20 years. Exactly. Yeah. But if you can relate to them and find something that really like intrigues them and relates mm-hmm. to what they're trying to do and it's going to get them to the next level, all of a sudden they went from not even thinking about, you know, drinking or smoking on the weekend to, you know, trying to stay within that hour of their normal exactly. bedtime. Yeah. And it, it's just been amazing, you know, when the messages that I get when people make those changes and you often you see them excel on the field yeah. and it's really cool. Yeah. I love it. Talk a little bit about sauna and cold plunge. Like how do you think about those modalities in the context of training? Um, how do you stack them? What is the timing? Those, yeah. You know, circadian is incomplete. Um, implications to both definitely i um it, it's funny because i think right now like the cold, obviously the cold plunge is very trendy <laughs> it's so trendy it's trendy <laughs> and, you're, and you're not allowed to do it without a video those are the two rules but but right. um i think that like so you know the studies have come out about you know the anabolic response from mm-hmm. the cold plunge after training and after yeah. lifting and I just, people really run with that. Yeah. yeah, they really like, do. I'm like, okay, <laughs> it's first off, this like point. this is pure hypertrophy and the chances that you're like maxing out the intensity for that workout to the point where that's even going to impact it are yeah. probably low. Yeah. And then also I'm thinking like, okay, the, the, that's pretty, it's going to have pretty minimal impact on, mm-hmm. on your, you know, hypertrophy. And then also if it's, if, if it's the choice of doing cold therapy or not, 
it's probably worth doing regardless of if that's the only time you yeah. get it in. So yeah. people really like to split hairs or I'll get people that message me and they're like, do you two, two minutes and 30 seconds in the cold <laughs> or three minutes? I'm like, yeah. you had 12 beers on Saturday. Like this is irrelevant. <laughs> just like get in there. Like just be cold for a while. Like that you're, that's the least of your problems, you know? <laughs> and, uh, but in regards to training, I think that, you know, we, we do like to use the cold as more of like a prep, like a, like a, you know, pre-workout type, spike in the morning yeah you know, usually in the morning or pre-practice if yeah. people are up for it we've been i've been experimenting that with that as well with some of the foot like some of the guys in the nhl last season like just like a 30 second like quick yeah. like yep. you know just to get the endorphins going yeah. and the the dopamine hit and yeah it seems like it's, it's the guys like loved it yeah i yeah. think it works super well and yeah. if you look at just like 30 seconds yeah and then yeah. you look at what's going on like in the brain i mean it makes total sense to yeah. do it then and then we also use it, um, you know, in, in swimming, there's prelims finals and it, you know, yeah. two swims in a day. So it's super useful, um, between sessions to keep the inflammation uh, low. Yeah. And then also it allows us to kind of mimic caffeine in the sense of like the dopamine yeah. before their night swim, but not impact their sleep that night, which is a huge issue. A lot of guys, you know, will, yeah. will come in and, and, you know, take a pre-workout energy drink. Yep prior to their night swim, but they have a big mm. swim the next day. Yeah. And that's going to cascade day after for day. Sure. Yeah. So we can use the cold therapy as yeah. a way to give them an energy boost. It's a proxy for like, just like a exactly. stimulant. It's yeah. super useful. Mm -hmm. But, um, I think, I think, like I said though, if you're not prepped and, and you're not sleeping well, you know, you're just going to be, you know, putting a, a bandaid on a bullet wound and, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> It's not going to end up well. Saunas, <laughs> I think sauna is more of a consistency thing we like to use. And we do, mm -hmm. we, I, I tend to recommend people to actually, we don't do as much contrast as most people do. Reason being is a lot of the data, I think they are, they are separated. There's actually mm -hmm. not, there's very minimal data on contrast yes. therapy. Mm -hmm. And what I like about separating them is the timing. You know, you can, you can be very specific with what outcome you're trying to get. Mm -hmm. And then two, you're following the data, you know what you're going to get. And I think the reason a lot of people do contrast training is it makes it just easier. Yeah. Like if you go in the sauna or the hot tub before yeah. you go in the cold, I think that you're probably not getting the full impact of either modality mm -hmm. because you're getting a little bit hot, but right. then you're so hot. You don't have the shock. Exactly. And you're not, you're not. So, so I think mm -hmm. that there's, um, there's probably some more long-term longevity outcome, mm -hmm. um, benefits, but from an athlete's perspective, we tend not to do as much contrast and, yeah. and separate them just so we're getting like the, the pure isolated form. And we know like, you know, the adaptations that are happening as opposed to kind of, you know, ending up in that middle ground of, you know, your, your core body temperature, just kind of, you know, staying relatively yeah. even. <laughs> I live in the North. So, you know, I'm in like the Boston area and the, yeah. the lake gets very, very cold. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so jump we're in like there. 37. What's that? You jump in. Oh yeah. I know. I definitely do. But it's funny. Cause I, you know, I'll get my hot, my car, like all nice and hot before. And I'm like, all right, I'm kind of cheating right now. Yeah, like I, yeah. you know, like I'm, I'm yeah. muting the response. I think a little bit, like it's not as painful. So I'm like, all right, just get in my car cold, keep it cold. And yeah. I'm just like, yeah. So I kind of play those mind games with myself. But last weekend um, we went down to, uh, my good friend, Jesse Itzler's house mm -hmm. and he just built a new cold plunge and this thing, he was basically like, give me the, <laughs> I want the best of the best. Oh, uh, wow. It's in ground. So it's, it's like oh, 10 dang. by 10. Wow. These, the chillers on this thing, it's in, in like a little, you know, bathhouse type thing. Yeah. I mean, they they look like air conditioners, like, like there's like three. Shit. And so the water coming out, I bet is 35 and the jets mm. are as strong as a hot tub. And oh. I have never experienced, I've been in, I literally took well, the folks don't know when the water is moving, fat. that is a whole different and, and experience this is really fast. than the water still. I mean, I literally, <laughs> it was 10 degrees outside one yeah. day in Michigan. I took a chainsaw, cut a square in the lake, Shut and went in there for three minutes. That's legit. Not close to this cold plunge. It was the most gnarly thing it's I've ever. It's the water ever, circulation. It was crazy. Yeah. And it's not like, you know, if you go in the, you know, the, some of the plunges, it's a little bit of circulation. This was mm -hmm. like, yeah. blow your face off circulation. And it, it was, by the end of three minutes, we were absolutely like shivering to the max. I've never experienced the jets before. That's I, haven't, I'm, I don't, it might be a one of one. I don't know if anything is as powerful in like the world, to be honest with you. Oh man. Woo. Okay. <laughs> it's like next level. I'm, yeah. It's like, man, I'm going to, I'm going to find one of those. Yeah. Get down there. Atlanta. Visit Jesse. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. I want to talk a little bit about nutrition just as a recovery modality. So yeah. when I think about recovery, you know, sleep is not bucket, you know, nutrition, stress, stress management. Uh, so nutrition is, uh, 
obviously very barbed wire topic in terms of just like it's really hard to figure out like what is the the best nutritional plan is highly individual like how do you think about that with clients in terms of like this overarching framework that you've been yeah i think or do you even touch it uh we tend to take more of a behavior change perspective Mm -hmm. on nutrition so meeting where they're at and then and changing you know small steps i guess we we don't necessarily go after an end goal right away Mm -hmm. and we kind of see where it takes us but i mean we're pretty um i would say open-minded and uh we don't like have a specific strategy necessarily like we don't push them towards a certain Mm -hmm. i I mean you know the mediterranean diet is is awesome and we tend to gravitate towards that but i think that um i mean just having a lot of times just having people have have you know greens and water is a great place to start but from a nutritional perspective too you know so uh, what there's a couple new studies that came out what two months ago and, and talked about you know, high fat content diets and the impact yeah. on slow wave sleep yeah. and just how it can even in- impact the architecture of people's sleep. So, you know, there's, there's the education side of that, but like we getting s- good fat is really impact. key for the brain. Definitely. Right. So there, I'm not surprised that there's a relationship between high quality fat during the day and how that might impact REM. Yeah. You know, your body, your brain's going to tap that. Definitely. Yeah. And, and I think so, so. I think it's more about, you know, are we getting, you know, well-rounded? We start with literally like what your plate should look like mm. in regards to, you know, fist sizes and things that yeah, are tangible for, simple. especially for kids to, mm-hmm. to hang on to. And then also just like the, the male, male, female breakdown, make sure it's individualized. Yeah. But we actually tend to bring in, we bring in dietitians for most of that stuff yeah. because I'm a big believer of, of people like being specialized in like a certain thing. <laughs> for sure. And, um, you know, the way the nutrition so individual, they're back, you know, also people have I, access to. And I think that people dietitians do not get enough credit like their yeah. background is amazing and what they have to go through to be an rd and it, it you know with all these like nutritionist type certifications uh, nowadays like you know talk, talking to an expert and, and i think i think what they do best is kind of see through the weeds and mm-hmm. and really focus on the things that that move the needle as mm-hmm. opposed to like there's so many trends and you're going to hear a million different things so yeah. you know following the data and then you know really almost like a funnel starting starting at the plates and then funneling it down to really maximize performance for the individual. But yeah. I think that a lot of people try to make this huge overhaul or go after a specific type of diet. And then it, it fails like 90% of the time, you know, yeah. especially even with an athlete that's extremely motivated. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think that perspective of everybody, when people are trying to make a, an overhaul, it's almost like sports betting, mm-hmm. right? And I always, <laughs> it's kind of a weird analogy. It's probably cause I like the sports bet, but, um, <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, you could take a bet that's like a 10 to one odds and you're going to, you're going to win like all this money, but you don't because the chances are so low. Yeah. And I think people don't think of it that way when, when they're trying to make a change in their life, you know, for like the keto diet, for example, the compliance rate is extremely low and like the outcome could be amazing, but it's almost like a bet. It's like, but the chances of you succeeding is so low. Why are you even taking that bet? Why not take a bet on something that's a lot higher chance that you're going to do it? Maybe the outcome takes longer. It's not exactly what you're looking for, but you'd rather win a little bit of money than lose it all. Yeah. And I think that's the approach. And I think that that's why I tend to gravitate towards sleep and sauna so much is because those are high compliance things that people enjoy. Yeah. Right. So if you can communicate them and educate them on why it's important, people aren't going to shy away from that. Right, and the compliance right. is high. Yeah. And then it creates momentum. You know, it mm-hmm. creates momentum. It's enjoyable. In other areas of their life. Right. Yeah, and they, they start, start sleeping better. They have more ex- exactly. capacity to exercise. They like, start craving yeah. alcohol less. Yeah. Like things start happening without them even realizing it's happening. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing. Like momentum is a real thing in sport and in, yeah. in changes and yeah. psychological changes. Yeah, I think the back to early, you know, kind of conversation around the 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 entry point to the psychology is is actually via the physiology. Like I just really believe that you can just make small changes that impact your physiology. Like you will see changes in how you view the world and your just perspective and your mindset. And definitely. So yeah, I think fi- and finding those like low barriers to entry, you mm-hmm. know, that are just like it's just so key. But I think so, so, there's something from a society when Mm -hmm. it comes down to like body composition, weight loss, Mm -hmm. performance, where people tend to go after the highest, like the the lowest compliance stuff. stuff It's like the hardest (laughs) stuff. And I'm like, why not start with the low hanging fruit? That's actually going to get the ball rolling. Uh, Yeah. And everything else gets easier. Literally. If you, if you sleep well, even a sauna, like who doesn't like to go in a sauna for a little bit. And then all of a sudden like mental health perspective, like your workouts, you feel better and you just stack those bricks and people tend to start the other way and then things fall apart. 
what are your kind of non-negotiable bricks? Like mm. if you were to kind of think, all right, you know, there obviously going to be outliers when you're going off and doing certain things like, you know, yeah. bachelor party or whatever. Yeah. Like, well, um, but what, you know, what are kind of like the bricks that you kind of put in place for yourself personally? Yeah. I mean, sleep is, is a non-negotiable for yeah. sure. So I, I prior, prioritize that. You look very well rested, Todd. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> uh, yeah, it depends. You, you can catch me in a bad time. I won't be, but yeah. Uh, sleep's a non-negotiable sauna is almost a non-negotiable mm -hmm. sauna, cold, sauna, cold plunge. I do every single day. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm in a city, I, I search for it. Yeah. Um, those are non-negotiables. And then, and then, you know, I really enjoy any type of cardiovascular training, um, from a mental health perspective. It makes mm -hmm. me feel so much better. Yeah. So I try to get at least minimally like 30 minutes of like steady state in the day. And then I'll strength train four days a week. So th that's pretty much like my, my non non-negotiables mm -hmm. where I'm going to probably do that regardless of the situation. Yeah. Beyond that, everything else is kind of sprinkled in, but yeah. you know, those are, I, I'm, I'm very regimented with that stuff and I seek it out. Like I, I'll yeah. make a point to do that because there's been times where I've done that when it's convenient. Mm -hmm. And I would say over the last year or so, mm -hmm. I've been able to, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have all this stuff in my house and, and I can do it on a regular basis and yeah. I feel substantially better. So yeah. now it's become like a non-negotiable. Yeah. And I think like that's what are yours? I'm curious. Yeah. For me, um, definitely, you know, polarized training is yeah. huge and strength training and same. Like I will pretty much lift every single day. Um, just a different body part. Like I don't like to spend, you know, an hour and a half lifting. Yeah. So I just kind of think about right, over the course of six days, like what kind of, what body parts am I going to tackle like yeah. each day? And I usually do that, um, prior to a sprint interval workout, I'll lift beforehand. Um, usually after my zone two, I'll lift afterwards and, you know, I try to like, I mean, I just feel so much better when I'm working out and there's really nothing I can do to my body that is gonna, um, hurt my recovery next day. And, yeah. and so I think from, and that's where whoop has been really powerful for me, you yeah. know, is I can kind of see that, all right, you know, I can pretty much, you know, in an hour, hour and a half, you know, I'm really not gonna be able to do anything to my body physiologically. That's going to impede my recovery tomorrow. It is how I sleep. Yep. And that's my other non-negotiable is definitely like stabilizing when I go to bed and when I wake up and really trying to stay within that 45 minute window to the best of my ability. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not about being perfect. Like I can't do it all the time and that's okay. But you know, 25 days out of the month, like I'm really trying to stabilize yeah. knowing that that's going to ladder up to, um, you know, preventing cognitive decline and Alzheimer's and cancer proneness. Like it's just, there's such a strong just metabolic dysfunction, like insulin resistance. Like there's mm -hmm. just such a strong correlation between night to night variability and all of those things. I think it's actually probably the most impactful human behavior based on like all of the I literature agree. and just my, my work. In I mean, that's, that's, that's why I just, I, that I become I, literally obsessed I with know, it. I know. I know. And sleep with variability, like or timing, you know, really drives like restored of sleep as well. So I think that just knowing that there's these connections is really powerful. So sleep wake time. Um, and then I'm a huge fan of hot and cold and yeah. really try to build that in. I do, you know, kind of the minimum viable dose. So kind of 12 minutes uh, across yeah. the week of cold and then, you know, and then I have a, a sauna, you know, in my house, which I feel really fortunate yeah. um, to have that. Yeah. So I'm, you know, do about 60 minutes um, a week of that. And then, you know, I would say hydration, you know, it's stuff that I see at a population level really move around our metrics. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, um, definitely time restricted eating is massive. So I really try to stop, you know, my final calorie is going to be three hours before when I, before I intend to sleep. That, that for me, it makes a huge difference. It's, and I will say on the nutrition side, like when we're coaching, like, you know, we're talking to folks, I said, you know, quality and content of food is, is, can be hard to change, but I think as like a, you know, one brick to lay that will like lead to more positive changes is just restricting the, your feeding window. Yeah, definitely. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I'm curious, uh, I'm going to have a phlebotomist come in and we're going to do all this blood work. We're going mm -hmm. to like literally just saw on a cold plunge lift, um, not even before bed and then wake up and take, you know, growth hormone measurements, try to do some really oh cool gosh. stuff. Yeah. yeah. There's a company with blokes I work with and we're going to try to do all this different stuff. So I'm super stoked about it. Wow. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm always curious, you know, again, limited data, but I feel so much different. I sleep so much better when I give that gap. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess that's another struggle with athletes sometimes is from a caloric perspective yep. of like, let's say, you know, knowing the impacts that having that window provides, but also knowing the impacts of, you know, just from an energy balance mm -hmm. perspective, mm -hmm. what takes priority? I think that's well, very difficult. You want to distribute those calories throughout the day. Right. And that's where I think athletes 
hurt themselves mm-hmm. and why they feel like they have to do this pre really massive pre bed, yep. you know, bolus. If you're eating the right amount of calories throughout the day, you don't need to do that. Right. But it's hard because a lot of athletes, especially I know in swim, mm-hmm. their their PM practice will end at 8 PM sometimes depending yeah. on the schedule. Yeah. So they need to have, so I think that's, I think yeah. that's a challenge. And I think it's, it's, you know, you know, coaching them on even just having it pre-made right after practice as opposed to yeah. having to make it like those little changes make a yeah. big impact, but or um, having that big, their biggest meal, maybe at lunch that yeah. day for an APM. So they're getting, you know, big, big bolts of calories, mm-hmm. like, you know, in the mid- midday and then yeah. before sleep, they're having more of like a bioavailable, like a digestible kind mm-hmm. of protein Quick, rich except, yeah. Yeah, fat. It's hard but, when you're, when you're fighting social norms, no, we t- I, I see that that's, that's probably yeah. the biggest, um, resistance we get yeah. like the weekend stuff the weekend stuff is it's very very hard for people mm-hmm. i think when you're that's the competitive advantage though baby i know like i, I, I know. if you get athletes to who are really trying to do hard things and and compete at the highest level that is the competitive advantage because that's when all your competitors are just you know they're doing stupid shit you know yeah yeah and it, well and, and plus you know especially in in, in timed sports you know, or individual sports it's like yeah. the, the margin of victory oh, is insane dang. it's, it's so like, small yeah so anything you can do, at least from my perspective, I would do literally. That's how my wife was like anything you could do. I, and I, I couldn't live with knowing that I left stuff on the table. It would be know. horrible to live yeah. with, especially if you came up a little bit short. So, right. um, you know, I actually think that athletes are better at that stuff. I think the weekend thing for the general population, tough. Yeah, because it is tough. But you think about like, I always think about a perspective of, all right, like, I, you know, again, I'm going to have those weekends, of course, you know, and, and I, I love it and I embrace it when I'm in the moment. But and I think about how it impacts my Monday, Tuesday, I'm spending three days just to get back to neutral. Yeah. You know, and 100%. I'm like, it's just like not worth it to me. Yeah. Like I, I can't, but I would say that's 80% of the population it, is doing no that question. every single week. There's no question about it. And you know, and it's, it's not, everyone's making a choice like, and, and I'm not like, I'm not saying that my choices are better. I'm just saying like, I know my values. I want to wake up with as much joy and energy as humanly possible. So I can be present for my family my loved ones and the things that I want to think about. And I know that there are a set of behaviors that is going to ladder up to that or not. Yeah. And it's very binary in my opinion. Like there is I call the principle of non-neutrality. Either your behaviors are laddering up to enable you to live your values yep. with joy and energy or they're not. And it, it's like you just, then you just, you make conscious choices yeah. and I'm not judging those choices. I'm just saying like, you just figure I feel out like, like you're judging you're, it a little bit. I might yeah. be a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I'm not judging you, but I'm judging. No, 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 no. no I, but, but truly like people have different values, like different sets of priorities and, and commitments. And so I'm, I, I actually really am not judging. I'm just saying, you know, I, I just, I think coming to that conversation naive though, mm-hmm. and not understanding your choices and how they're impacting the things that you say you care about and that you stand behind like to me, that's the conversation that I think people aren't as ha- happy to have. They're not. Well, no, <laughs> they they don't want to be hit in the face with that because that's. Uh, I th- I think when I think a lo- I think honesty and, and self reflection mm-hmm. is a very rare strength mm-hmm. when people are able to do that because I think yeah. a lot of people avoid that and they actually don't. They're not honest with themselves about what is important to them and what their value. Yeah. I think if in their head their actions are probably much different than actually what plays out on paper. Yeah. Similar to if somebody logs their food, but I think yeah. if you wrote down all the behaviors, what's important to them, what they're trying to achieve in their life, mm-hmm. chances are, especially regarding sleep, they think things are a one-off or it's just a Saturday, whatever it may be. But when you actually spell it out and write it out and, and do some ex- self-exploration, it's it's the majority of their life yeah. is in that place where they don't want to be. Yeah. But I, I think it's it's easy to slip into that and not be aware. I think I think yeah. honestly, with sleep, a lot of times it's it's. I think awareness is probably 90% of it yeah. because it's not people, something people often think about up until three years ago. Like yeah. you'd be, you would sound like a crazy person talking about this stuff. I, know. I, I mean, know. look it's at so like true. Huberman, for example, like the fact that his podcast has exploded yeah. just shows the shift in, 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 in the, the population. I know. It's why, I mean, that would 10 years ago, people would be like, what is this? I know. And now, you know, people are into this and, yeah. it, and, and just, you know, your, your average person. Mm-hmm. So it's really He's, cool. He said one of his quotes was like, you know, I think, we're at a time in human history where there's like this call to arms like yeah. from mother nature where we just need to take back control of our autonomic nervous system, yeah. you know? And I just think that is the most beautiful quote and I use it all the time citing him, of course, but I, you know, it's like, I think the competitive advantage in this world is either you're going to understand and be able to control your physiology or not. or not. And if you cannot control your physiology, 
you are going to get left behind. Yeah. You are not going to evolve and, and, and yeah. survive. And you can't, you can only fight it for so long. Yeah. That's what that, I think people don't realize that is like willpower and motivation, all that stuff. When you're fighting your physiology, it's going to chip away. Yeah. It's almost like the person. You can't talk yourself into a better future. No. You, for a little bit of time, you can. It, it, yeah. You know, it's humans almost are like amazing, the, uh, but <laughs> the Persians and, and the Spartans, it's like it just yeah. kind of chips away and eventually <laughs> you can only hold for so long, you know? That's right. So. That's right. Uh, Todd, what are you obsessing over right now? What am I obsessing over right now? It, you do, you mean in my life or like from a, uh, from a, yeah, physiological I, I think, perspective. Yeah, we just we kind of ask all of our guests like what they're uh, obsessing over right now. So you can take it uh, in whatever direction. You I want. mean, I'm obsessing over our, our dream mouth tape. It's it's been um, it's exceeded my expectations and and mm-hmm. the feedback we're getting from people and, and the positive impact it's having on people's lives. Like it it's so it makes me so happy because wow. that's the experience that I had. Um, and you know, whenever you're helping people out and you know doing something you love, it it's the best feeling in the world. So yeah. it's similar to like when an athlete does really well, but it's, we've been able to reach so many people. So yeah. we're just, just focusing, focusing on that and, and new products and, um, you know, tweaking products and, and making things better. It's been super fun and, uh, you know, beyond grateful for the support people like my friends and, and even people that, that I haven't met, like the, the support's been overwhelming and, um, you know, it's always humbling when that happens. You're impacting a lot of lives. That's, that's the goal for sure. Yeah. Thank you for all your good work. It's been <laughs> super fun talking to you today. Yeah, it's been awesome. And I, I don't get the chance to do a lot of like in-person yeah. podcasts, so appreciate the conversation so much. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, incredible. Thank you to Todd Anderson for sharing his best practices and insight on training, longevity, and sleep. If you enjoyed this episode of the Whoop Podcast, please subscribe to the Whoop Podcast. You can check us out on social at Whoop at Will Ahmed. If you have a question you want to see answered on the podcast, email us podcastwhoop.com. Call us 508 443 4952. You can join Whoop for free for 30 days. That's our free trial at whoop.com. New members can use the code WILL, W I L L, and get a $60 credit on Whoop accessories. And that's a wrap. Thank you all for listening. We'll catch you next week on the Whoop podcast. So stay healthy and stay in the green.